So we would like to start with our today's press briefing of the Science Media Center Germany. My name is Annegret Burkert. I'm an editor for Medicine and Life Science here at the Science Media Center Germany. And the topic of today's press briefing um, is the SARS-CoV-2 variant B1617. This variant originally evolved in, in India, and we all know this dramatic pictures that we have seen during the last weeks where the second wave of COVID-19 infections has led to thousands of new infections every day and several severe disease outcomes. And during the last weeks, the variant has also spread to other countries and can be found now in many places all over Europe. And especially in the United Kingdom, the arrival and the spread of this variant B1617 has been tightly monitored and the virus has been characterized. The two experts here today are involved in this monitoring process and in the analysis of B1617. This is um, Professor Neil Ferguson. He is the director of the MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis at the Imperial College in London. And Professor Ravindra Gupta, who is a professor of clinical microbiology at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm very happy um, that you are here with us today and that you are willing to share your insights on this new viral variant. And before I start, I would like to point out uh, that you attendees, you can now already start to um, ask your questions in our question and answer tool. For our British colleagues who joined today, um, I would like to point out that um, we don't uh, take your questions directly, but uh, please put your questions in this question and answer tool and then my colleague will forward them to me. And to our German colleagues, I we would be very grateful if you could uh, ask your question directly in English, that would make it much easier for us. So I would like to start with a question to Professor Ferguson, who is and has been involved in the modeling of the SARS-CoV-2 distribution in Great Britain. How do you currently evaluate the growth of B1617-2 in the UK during the last week? And how is the current situation? Are you concerned? So, I mean, like B117, the Kent variant before it, what we're seeing now is <clears throat> this Indian variant, 617.2, um, quite rapidly replacing um, previous variants in circulation, particularly the Kent one. Uh, and that growth has been fairly consistent in the last um, four weeks or so. I think there's a big difference, though, to comparing the situation we're in now with the situation which held back in December of last year when we were looking at the Kent variant replacing, namely infection levels are very, very low at the current time. And so whilst we're seeing um, this variant grow quite quickly, it's very hard to, uh, to estimate really how much of a transmission advantage it has over the Kent variant, because effectively they're circulating in quite different population groups. The Kent variant is quite still generally um, distributed across the population, but at very low levels, whilst this new Indian variant came in through imports into a small subset of communities across the country where it's grown quickly then. So that sort of situation makes it difficult to be definitive about you know, how much more transmissible this variant is compared with what we've seen before. What we can say though, is it is definitely more transmissible and it could be anywhere from you know, 20% to 80% more transmissible, but we really can't pin a number on that at the moment. So the Kent variant, because I think this term is not used so, uh, used so usually here in Germany, is the B117 variant, B117, right? B117, yes. So B117 was considerably more, probably 60, 70% more transmissible than variants which came before it. We think this Indian variant, B1617.2, is um, more transmissible than B117, but we can't exactly quantify how much at the current time. And um, to my last question, are you concerned? Uh, how do you evaluate this growth that you see during the last days or weeks? I mean, it would be certainly, we'd be in an easier position if um, the, this variant had not arisen undoubtedly. And so, I mean, there are some concerns I think we're in a much better position. I'm talking about the UK now than we were um, you know, five, six months ago when B117 arose. Um, 
first of all, we're starting from much lower infection levels, but also we have vaccinated over half the population. And so vaccination will make a substantial difference, even against a mutated strain like, like the Indian variant. We think, um, that we can maybe come on to that later, but we think um, whilst there probably is some effect of the Indian variant on, um, on vaccine efficacy, still vaccine effectiveness against, particularly against severe disease is still going to be very high. Yeah. Um, there is a, a follow-up question directly. Um, is there a slight increase in the still low incidences in UK? Um, and can this um, slight increase now be related to B1617? Yes. I mean, it's a simple answer to that. There is a slight uptick now in inf infection rates in the UK, and that is down to um, B1617.2. All right. Um, Mr. Gupta, you have analyzed the variant already in the lab. Um, how does it discriminate from the CAN, the B117 variant? So the, the, the 617 variant has a couple of different sort of types. One is a 0.1 and a, there's another one, the 0.2, then then there's a third. But the, the, the two main ones are different um, in a few ways, but there's one key change in the receptor binding domain, which is on the surface of the virus. And by comparing the two, uh, uh, the six, the point one and the point two, they look a little bit. They look fairly similar, but for some reason, the point two seems to have um, dominated infections here in the UK and in India. So there must be something special potentially about the the point two. Um, looking at the way that neutralizing antibodies that are contained in blood from vaccinated individuals, how well that is able to deal with um, these, uh, you know, vi artificial viruses that. That, that represent the 617.2. We can see that there's a moderate reduction in susceptibility of the virus to those antibodies. So there is a there is a difference. It's um, a little bit less sensitive or more resistant than the B117. It's not quite as um, resistant to antibodies as the South African variant B1.351. So it's somewhere in the middle, somewhere somewhere sitting somewhere where the Brazil variant, for example, sits. So so it does have uh, the ability to. Um, make antibodies less effective. And that's important because I think the, the reason that we're seeing growth potentially is that the virus not only can do some partial evasion, and that's important because so many people are vaccinated now. And in India, there was a, quite a high proportion of people who had previous immunity because they'd been infected in previous waves. Um, and then there's, there's a mutation in, there, in that virus also that's not about evasion. It's about increasing the infectivity of the virus. And we're still doing some work to show that we think that the, 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 the Indian variant has a mutation that makes it much more um, able to infect cells and to transmit between cells quicker. So in other words, that might lead to greater viral load, might lead to greater transmissibility. Um, so do you think that um, this variant has an advantage in a vaccinated or immunized population um, versus B117? And would the picture be different? Like, for example, in Germany, not so many people have got two shots yet, as a, um, the full vaccination. So is it likely that, for example, this variant would not be as dominant in a country like Germany where not so many people are immunized yet? Yeah, that's a, that's a really important uh, point. That uh, is the relative advantage um, to do with the immune, es immune escape or immune sort of evasion. Um, I think that that's part of the, potentially part of the explanation, although we're seeing it you know, be the point to Indian variant in unvaccinated individuals as well. Um, uh, the question about the first dose, you know, yes, the, we, there are data that PHE, Public Health England released showing that uh, a single dose is not, not that effective at stopping infection. Uh, and that that level of infection is reduced for the B617.2 variant even further. So that 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 fits with the in vitro data. The, after the second dose, the, the levels of antibodies are very very high. So there's really good protection across the board. Again, there is a small reduction for the the 0.2 variant. So uh, yes, in somewhere like Germany or, or in populations where there's partial immunity, either from previous infection or, or low levels of antibody. Um, then the virus will have that nice sort of in the sweet spot of an advantage of immune evasion plus greater transmission. And remember, you've got to remember that some of these mechanisms for increasing infectivity of the virus um, will also help it to escape antibodies as well. And it's, I won't explain it now, but it's to do with the way that the virus moves from cell to cell without having to leave the cell and therefore the antibodies can't reach uh, uh, those viruses. So 
Um, yes, I think that, that the viruses will have a, an advantage in uh, under immunized um, or partially vaccinated individuals. So in your... Can I, oh, can I just yeah. add to that a little? Um, so undoubtedly a degree of immune escape, and we can't quantify precisely what effect that's having on transmission, that will help the virus in a country such as the UK. But if we look at data from India, and actually even looking at the UK data, it can't be the whole picture. It's almost certain that this virus has an intrinsic transmission advantage on top. I mean, it's more transmissible even in um, uh, people who haven't been immunized or hadn't, haven't had a prior infection. But we can't say whether that's a kind of 10% increase or a 50% increase at the current time. So um, in your last preprint, Mr. Gupta, you also um, mentioned a case uh, from an Indian hospital where healthcare workers uh, who were fully vaccinated um, had an infection or like a yeah, infection group um, with this uh, B1617 variant. So if fully vaccinated people start to spread the virus again and the virus again is more transmissible and then also can reach uh, unvaccinated people, what does this mean now with all um, also your uh, strategies of opening up? Like how do you evaluate this whole situation? Yes, I mean, uh, yeah, see, seeing the, the cluster I, we described was quite, I mean, I was very surprised by it because that's a single virus that is transmitted to 12 people with very few changes in you know, suggesting it's a single transmission event. So they were potentially in the same room as each other. They were not wearing masks and uh, the transmission happened despite full vaccination. And there was enough virus in those individuals to sequence, which means it was a you know decent amount of virus. Um, Fortunately, nobody got very sick. So the, the virus, vaccines are still doing their job. They're still protecting you from, from you know, severe disease. But as you said, the, the, the worry here is that this is a, an avenue for the virus to persist in a population and then to reach unvaccinated people or vulnerable people in society. Um, and in the context of opening up, my, I've you know, made the point a couple of times that I, I believe that we should potentially be, um, let's say, Uh, allowing vaccines to have their full effect, which means a waiting a little bit longer to reach more people, get second doses into more people, uh, so that the virus is, you know, has a very, very strong barrier against it. Right now, we have a, an issue where we're increasing social contacts uh, in the face of an expanding uh, um, uh, growth of the virus. And so that gives the virus an opportunity to really seed itself within the UK population. And it's going to be very difficult to get rid of it once it's there. So I think That's my that's my opinion. Um, so I, yeah, um, the next question is what, if anything, can the data from India itself tell us about transmissibility and vaccine escape? Um, are you mentioning the genomic surveillance data from other countries in Europe, such as Germany's, where the B1617 variant makes up about 2% of new cases? This question i got in i can uh, i don't know if you got it correctly i didn't get it well i think that what they're saying is that it, it looks like that the, the the indian variant is at low prevalence um in european countries but yes that may be just because there have been a few importations it might be that because vaccination coverage is lower than you know that that that's you know that the competition between b117 and 617 is maybe a little bit more even it's probably different populations Maybe the surveillance, of course, the surveillance in Germany is, I can't, I can't remember what proportion of new infections you're sequencing, but it may not be as high as some other areas. So there are lots of reasons. I would not use that as, as necessary. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily be reassured by the fact that it's low in country X or country Y at the moment. It's all about what, what's happening, what the restrictions are, what the vaccine coverage is, you know, and those things will, will, will feed into the long-term outlook. And I think learning from India is important, although, We don't have very good serology data from extensive areas to know what the background immunity level was or the you know previous exposure was. Obviously, vaccination is very low in India, so the findings in India could very well be explained by transmission in unvaccinated people who have not been infected before. Um, but I think there is an element from what we're hearing from reports from various people, um, family members, and you know, you know that 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 people who have had previous infection are getting infected again. Many of them are getting severe disease, um, and that includes the people who have been partially or fully vaccinated as well. So, yeah. Mm. So we should take we should take note of that. We should take it seriously, is what I'm saying. 
Yeah, Mr. Ferguson, um, are you um, um, also monitoring the genomic surveillance data from other European countries, for example, such as from Germany and include them in your modeling? And what can you see there currently? So mostly we're not so much modeling the data, but just analyzing it in kind of traditional statistical methods. Um, yes, I mean, as a team, we're looking at data from across the world. I would say the UK is, you can't say much from most other European countries apart from the UK because the numbers of sequences are so low and the first recorded case is so recent. We have no data with which to really assess the trajectory of how, how quickly it's expanding. And, and you know, as my colleague just said, I mean, it, there are delays in the system in the surveillance and surveillance varies from country to country. So we will have to almost certainly, just as we did before with B117, we will have to wait a few weeks to really see what trends we see in across the continent of Europe. Um, the UK, because of its historically high levels of, of, of connectivity with mobility, travel to and from India, um, has been more, much more heavily seeded than any other country in, in the continent. Um, there's another question to you, Mr. Gupta, and I will directly turn it to you since you need to leave a bit earlier. Um, it is interesting that the B16172 variant, which seems to be more transmissible, lost it uh, the one mutation. It's a E448Q mutation, which was um, before feared to be involved in immune escape. Do you think there is something about immune escape mutations somehow hinders transmissibility? Okay, yes. So we that in the point one variant, or uh, which is more closely related to the initial ancestor of the viruses, there was this E484Q mutation, which is, you know, in the same place that the 484K was, and that's the mutation found in, you know, the South African and Brazilian variants, respectively. So we know that that's a mutation we don't want to see. Um, the, the fear was that this would add on to the L452 mutation and make this sort of double mutant. And that's why there was all this double mutant sort of um, uh, a panic in India for a while. Um, we showed in vitro actually that they don't add up, the effects don't add up together. So you, to make a sort of really super resistant mutant, you just get this sort of same level. And that may be why the E484Q has been lost in the point two, because actually from the data we've generated, the 484 does not seem to add any element of additional immune escape onto the existing virus. So maybe it, it had some deficiency or maybe it was lost randomly. Um, and whatever it seems that 478 um, was acquired instead of it. And when we've tested 478, it also doesn't seem to add you know, a huge amount onto, those, um, onto that uh, immune evasion aspect, but it may have other roles. It may have tighter ACE2 binding. You know, there are other aspects of its biology that we haven't uncovered yet. So, 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 so 484 probably wasn't that beneficial for the virus. Um, Mr. Ferguson, you mentioned um, travel restrictions before. So you have mentioned that the Indian variant came to the UK through travel. And some uh, European countries have now imposed restrictions on travel from the UK now. From an epidemiological perspective, do you think such travel restrictions are good measures to limit the spread uh, to continental Europe? And if so, should all European countries take the step? Mm. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to directly answer that question. <laughs> I mean, tra travel restrictions, um, it depends what they, they do. I mean, they, at best, they are likely to slow um, spread unless they're you know, very dr draconian. They're not going to be successful at keeping these things out forever. Um, and that's the history we can see across the pandemic. So, um, you know, the Indian strain is now quite widely distributed across the world in, in dozens of countries. And people's travel patterns involve going from one country to another. And so, yeah, some restrictions on travel in the UK may slightly slow the import of, of cases into European countries, but I don't doubt it's going to have a very large effect, partly because infection levels at the moment are still very low in the UK. Mm. Um, another point that I've... I'm very interested in. So there seems to be an enhanced spread in school children um, in India. And there were also the warnings from Singapore that um, the B1617 variant is more pathogenic in children. Can you confirm that those signals? 
I can, I can talk to the epidemiology. And, um, so there's a, there's a hint in the data that um, the under 21s are slightly more likely to be infected with this variant compared with other variants in, in recent weeks in the UK. Whether that reflects a change in the biology or reflects what's called founder effects and the contacts, the people who came into the country with the virus made and then seeding of infection in certain schools, colleges, um, that's, that's impossible to resolve at the moment. We, so we don't have, we have a signal, but we can't really interpret its meaning in, a, in terms of biological hypotheses. As for pathogenicity, as to how, you know, severe infection is we really have no data on that and there's no signal that i'm aware of that this is you know more severe in children than other variants yeah mr gupta do you want to add something to if um, b1617 is more pathogenic in children i think as my colleague um, neil said uh, it's difficult to establish at the moment it's too early i think them but again i do think we should take reports seriously because that's you know, the first sign that you have of, 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 of a problem. And often if you wait too long for the right data, it's too late. Um, so we should be receptive to what's coming out. Hopefully the countries where they're seeing this will be studying it in a kind of rigorous way so that we can get that information. Um, I think if it were true, I think we may have seen it from India already. Um, uh, so, so that's, you know, what sort of makes it more complex. But then again, I think maybe many schools have been I, think, I can't remember what the sort of closure system has been for schools, but uh, many states have had, you know, um, uh, lockdowns and cities have had lockdowns, which include school closures. So maybe the opportunity was to, <laughs> to see it. There's another specific question to you, Mr. Gupta, um, from a journalist who's, who's saying, I just talked to a Swiss expert and he said that while the B1671 variant has immune escape, mm -hmm. the B1671 variant hasn't, referring mostly to sequences. Is this correct so far? Uh, phenotypic, in, so, so when, when we make the viruses in, in vitro, um, they're, they seem to have similar effects. Um, one may be milder than the other, but sometimes it's difficult to tell because you're, you're testing these viruses against um, serum or antibodies from different donors, and that, that introduces some variability. And different people may get different results because they're taking antibodies from different populations. You know, we all make different antibodies. So um, you can't really look at the sequence and say uh, that you're, the one is more resistant than the other because we don't know much about those key mutations. We know very little about 478. We know very little about 484Q. And we don't know much about the way they combine with L452R, the, you know, the other key mutation. So uh, I would suggest that we are at an early stage of our understanding and we need to do more, more work and people are. All right. Um, Mr. Ferguson, um, is it possible that uh, B1617 has so far spread more in environments that favor greater spread? So we know that the spread in the UK is not really equally and um, that the measures effect is less on variant characteristics in these areas? Yes, very good question. And that, that's what I was trying to point out because it has been seeded into certain communities in the UK. Um, in some cases, communities with quite large, you know, multi-generational households, quite high population density. Some of the explosive spread we've seen in recent weeks may be down to the fact that the, the um, community groups it's, it's been seeded into just have higher contact rates. Um, um, in the coming weeks, as we see this variant spread into the wider population, we should be able to resolve those issues though. But it's still going to take two or three weeks more time before we can get a complete picture. But do you know if those, um, um, those groups, um, have they been already been vaccinated or are those group major, uh, largely non-vaccinated? So, I mean, there's some variation in vaccination levels across the UK, but still we're talking about populations with overall quite a high level of vaccine coverage. So um, it's, it's a, we're talking about differences of maybe 5% in coverage between different areas, not, not enormous differences. So that doesn't explain the rate of growth we've seen. And um, like what measures should be taken there? Um, can well, I mean, yeah. in Bolton in, in the north of England has been highlighted as a hotspot 
and it was a hot spot earlier in the pandemic in terms of transmission last, last autumn. Um, and it's true that vaccination levels were below the national average in up till a few weeks ago. And so, I mean, local, the local community and, and the government have responded by um, through what could be called surge vaccination by, by you know, re doubling down on, on asking people to get vaccinated and providing mobile vaccination centres so that people who previously may have been hesitant about being vaccinated were able to then be vaccinated and that undoubtedly will help. And Mr. Gupta, you think that um, the shortening of the interval also could help, um, yeah, to to um, yeah, to decrease the spread of the virus, if now the interval between the two vaccine doses is shortened. Yes, I mean, well, we have a twelve-week uh, uh, interval, and, and no doubt, that we, you know, the ideal thing is to have a three-week gap between the vaccinations, so that you are protected earlier to a, to a, to a reasonable level. Um, and, and certainly in the more vulnerable and people with poorer immune responses, I think that, you know, bringing them closer together is probably um, uh, advantageous. Before you need to leave now, I would like to ask you a last uh, question and I would like to look a bit in the future. Um, um, following GlassCoV2 now for almost one and a half years and uh, observing the rise of different uh, variants of concerns like B117, P1, and now this B1617-2 strain, what kind of variants do you think we need to prepare for? What could there still be coming? Yeah, that's a really important question, I think. I, I think that um, we have good vaccines now. We need to keep the pressure on vaccine designers, manufacturers to... Um, adapt vaccines uh, and use and we really need to think carefully about what we do how we do that what mutations what combinations what adjuvants what you know how what bits of the virus we need to use is it live viruses is it mrna vaccines these are things are still open questions for longer term control um, secondly the virus is going to do some weird things i mean this is just the beginning i think it's going to recombine you're going to get you know super mutant viruses i believe um, but that's not necessarily a bad, I mean, it's not necessarily a terrible thing, but the virus is going to do very unexpected things because the, the amount of pressure on it is going to be severe. So it, it will adapt, as we all know. Uh, and we know that people still get chronic infections, and that's how this all happens in general. So um, I think that we, it's hard to say what's going to happen, but the virus is, is going to find ways of becoming more infectious. You can see that already. So it's going to, it, when it's under pressure, it will try and be more efficient in transmission so that it can achieve the job with fewer virus particles. And, um, and so things like the 681 mutation, you know, for, uh, are just the beginning, there'll be, there'll be further ones coming, I'm sure. So not only is antibody escape, but actually increasing trans transmission advantage or tra infect infectivity advantage is next. And how do you, would you uh, like expect that uh, it can transmit quicker, but if the population is largely vaccinated, then this, um... Yeah, it's still not uh, yeah overwhelmed uh, our societies anymore because if they are largely immunized, then it's yeah. maybe just a yeah like a cold or yeah. Well, yeah, I think I think as the coverage goes up, uh, uh, yes, for most people it will be a mild uh, illness, even with these super variants or whatever you want to call them. You know, most people will still be protected against the uh, severe effects of the disease, so that's great. Um, but there will be some vulnerable people. We, we see with flu, we have a lot of deaths each year from, from flu in, 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 in vulnerable groups. We, we, uh, we try to vaccinate them first to protect them, um, but it doesn't always work. Um, so I think, but I don't think we should say it's going to be like flu automatically. I think that this is an unpredictable virus and we shouldn't um, be, be overconfident at any stage. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you need to leave now, uh, I, yeah, I, thanks. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, the next question to you, Mr. Ferguson. Um, the current reopenings that we see across uh, European countries, could they help the spread of the Indian variant? And how inevitable is uh, that that this variant will become dominant like the Kent variant did uh, a few months ago? So undoubtedly reopenings are going to help any variant um, spread. I mean, if you have higher contact rates between people, um, that's good for the virus. I think, it is perhaps, it's probably likely the, uh, the um, B1617.2 
will dominate, but not certain at the moment. As I say, we just need more information on really the level of the transmission advantage. If it is substantially more transmissible than B117, it will eventually dominate. Mm -hmm. And how should stronger measures against the spread of the variant be balanced with the success of the vaccine campaigns? So, I mean, we had an earlier question on this topic. I think it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, all of these um, key quantities are a matter of degree. How much does this variant, you know, manage to evade vaccine induced immunity? How much more transmissible is, is it will determine really whether any future third wave in the UK, for instance, in the summer or early autumn, is manageable or um, risks um, overwhelming the health system again and therefore a reversal of, of the current UK roadmap out of lockdown. And so the roadmap the UK is adopting with a, in the context of a high level of vaccine coverage of gradually reopening is robust to a certain level of increase in transmissibility of the virus and a certain limited level of immune escape, of evading the vaccines, but only a certain amount. If it goes beyond those levels, then we need to reconsider the rate of reopening and maybe slow the next step. I know less about all the different plans in every European country, but the same principles will, will hold. I mean, if one behaves cautiously and reopens gradually and evaluates the data step by step on, you know, what every step and relaxation does to transmission, then you're much like more likely not to need to have to reverse course later. Yeah. Um, so experts in the UK uh, that also include your group um, have suggested a more transmissible virus could cause a large third wave of hospitalizations, even without mm. the modest vaccine escape shown. Does this still hold? Um, you sound more optimistic now. Well, I say it's a matter of degree. If, if you if you hypothesize and look at a scenario where a variant is, let us say, 60 percent more transmissible, has a certain degree of immune escape, that could well lead to a, another third wave of the size the UK has just come out of. But if the if the level of you know, transmissibility increase is only 20 percent or 30 percent and there's only a little bit of evasion of immunity, then you get a much, much lower third wave. There's not a proportionality between the, a, a direct linear relationship between the extent of transmission advantage and the size of any predicted third wave. It's a much more complicated situation than that. It's almost, almost akin to having a threshold. We can cope with a certain level of increased transmissibility and still be in a good position to you know, continue with the roadmap. But if it's higher than that, we need to reconsider. Mm -hmm. um, there is a follow-up question on the topic that we touched um, before, uh, um, infections in younger people. And one journalist is asking this. In addition, um, uh, he wants to check if you are referring to B1672 when we comment on infections under 21 also, uh, in younger people. Yeah, so just to reiterate, what we see is there's a slightly greater propensity for B1617.2 infections um, to be affecting those under 21 than B117. But I just want to reiterate that may have nothing to do with the biological properties of the virus. It may just be a, a factor of the communities within which this infection has been seeded from travelers from India. Okay, I um, would like also now to come to an end. And with you, I would like also to look into the future and how you evaluate the next months, like um, um, the next restrict, um, as a, the um, opening steps are coming in June, I think. And um, how do you look in the future? How, how do you evaluate what will come? So if I could completely predict the future, I mean, I would be, <clears throat> be in a much better position. I think we're continuing to evaluate data. I think it's actually too early to say whether we will be able to go ahead with what was planned in the UK in, in mid-June and, and the next step, basically a full relaxation of measures, or whether that um, 
that fourth stage of relaxation will need to be postponed, or indeed, um, in the worst case, measures need to be tightened up. We will know, we're getting more and more data every week, but we hope to be in a position to be more definitive about these answers in the next two to three weeks. And from what you've like known from or um, your um, yeah, what you know from the B117 um, development in the beginning of the year, what what would need to happen now that um, you um, will tell like uh, the the responsible persons to really um, stop opening up and um, enlarge the restrictions again? Like what needs to happen? How high do the cases have to rise, or what do you have to see in the population? It's not about it's not about how high the cases rise. It's about how quickly they're rising, and in particular, are we seeing evidence of a a rapid rise in hospitalizations? I mean, at the moment, we're at very low infection levels, very low numbers of people hospitalized. But it's the trend which is important. If we start seeing, for instance, case numbers doubling every ten to fourteen days and hospitalizations following the same track, that would be of concern. We always expected to see case numbers rise as we relax, and that's sort of built into the plan that we can cope with that. It's just if they're rising too quickly, then that will be a problem. So there just came in another question that I quickly forward to you. Uh, which data do you await with modeling the impact of new variants? Which ones are you missing to better assess the future? So we analyze, I mean, one benefit is, I mean, the UK has a remarkable amount of data coming in. Um, both, both genetic sequence data, which is the most important probably for variants, but we link that data to things like case symptomatic case testing, to immunization records, to hospitalization records. And so, and then we, and on top of that, we have data streams like serology in the population, the overall numbers vaccinated, and it's all at a very fine individual level. So it's, It's pulling all of those different data sets together and linking them, which gives us insight into things like, so quickly into things like, what impact is this variant having on vaccine effectiveness? Mr. Ferguson, thank you so much for taking thank the you. time. Um, for um, you out there, I would like to remind you that we recorded this briefing and you can watch it again uh, by entering our website. And we also will transcribe um, the briefing and you will find the transcript um, as soon as possible also on our website. Thank you so much for your attendance. And Mr. Ferguson, thank you so much for your time. Have a good thank afternoon. You.